And up next is Doug McBurney, who is a fellow worker with the late, great Bob Enyart. As a friend, business manager, and co-host for 25 years, and now co-host Real Science Radio along with Fred Williams, his daughter, Doug and his daughter, Nicole, are dedicated to honoring Jesus Christ and continuing the creation science ministry. That was Bob's third greatest passion after the gospel and his family. Mm. He's joining me and welcoming to the 2023 Hydroplate Conference, the very first one in history, the co-host of Real Science Radio, Mr. Doug McBurney. Well, thank you very much, Brian. And I, I did get your email last night. Brian's already about promoting the second Hydroplate conference. He had to start doing that before he went to bed last night. <laughs> so anyway, I very much appreciate it. Very much appreciate all the work that you've done, Brian. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending our presentation. It's called A Creationist Explanation for the Features of the Moon, or as we like to call it, the man in the moon. Now, this talk is based on a paper written by my daughter, Nicole, and I. And the paper has been submitted to hydroplate.org. Hopefully, it's accepted and published so everyone will have a chance to read it. It's much drier than this presentation. The idea for the paper, by the way, was suggested about two years ago by Ellen McHenry and... Nicole and I and everyone in our orbit, we just want to thank Ellen for her uh, inspiration and for Brian and for uh, uh, Brian Lauer and Joe Spears for really all of them doing yeoman's work, putting on this first Hydroplate conference, which I'm convinced based on what I just saw with Kevin Lee that, I mean, I, I laughed at Barack Obama when he said we're living history because, you know, we're all living history, obviously. But this is, in my humble opinion, a historic event. Uh, and so I'm glad you're here. And I think 50 years from now, those of you who are still alive will look back and realize that this really was uh, a historic moment in the creation movement and in the history of the gospel. Um so thank you for everyone who's helped put on this conference. All right, we're going to get right to it. But first, let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for the, the ability to just speak to the people. I want to thank you for the enlightenment that you've given us with your word, with what you've written in your word, Lord, and with what you've written on the face of the earth and down in the depths of the earth, what you've written on the face of the moon. The heavens declare the glory of God, and we thank you for that, Lord. And our goal today is to just glorify you and to just try to point people to more truth about you so that more of them can get to know you, so that we can all be together in eternity together. We thank you and love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. And now we're going to get right to it here, I hope. If I can figure out how to change the slides, which I think I have. All right. So, folks, what appears to us as the man in the moon is actually a network of craters and remnants of ancient lava flows. The tendency of the human mind to make shapes and shadows into understandable pictures leads most people, usually as children, to see something like the shape of a face in the moon. And so since we were all little kids, we've all been familiar with the man in the moon. But the far side of the moon facing away from Earth has a completely different topography from the near side we see. The far side is pockmarked with hundreds of craters of varying sizes, but virtually none of the dark disfigurement that Galileo's contemporaries called maria or seas. That's the word for seas in Latin, and that's what they called them. That's what we see. But the back side of the moon is completely different. Can the dramatic difference in topography between the two lunar hemispheres be explained? And can that explanation help us understand why the moon looks the way it does? And does the difference in the hemispheres explain other related phenomena in our solar system? And are there important reasons to ask about the man in the moon? Are the explanations we've heard good enough? Do we need more of an explanation? Well, let's start by talking about the rationale for a fresh look at the man in the moon and how it relates to creation science. 
Creation science is driven by the investigation of two major events, the creation and the flood. And there have been many theories developed as we've studied both the creation and the flood. And, and this is a chart of the Kuhn cycle describing a paradigm shift. So normal science there, in 1980, that would have been the canopy theory, right? That would have been normal science in creation science. In creation science. Today, that's mostly catastrophic plate tectonics. And just like canopy theory drifted eventually into crisis because of the observable evidence and was eventually discarded, so in my opinion has catastrophic plate tectonics. At least where the flood is concerned, it's time for a model revolution. The model that many creationists are looking at is in crisis, and it's time for a new one. Uh, it's and, and we've I want to look at several reasons to reevaluate theories about the flood and the moon and uh, how those figure into our opinion. We believe one of the keys to a better flood model is explaining the features of the moon. And here's our rationale. First, the young earth creationist view requires an immense amount of cratering on the moon recently and in a short period of time. A mechanism for such a bombardment should be clearly elucidated. Second, errant bullets flying through space are not very good as the creation is described at the end of Genesis chapter one. So establishing how anything that might have bombarded the moon had its origin and when it had its origin would better help creationists establish and defend the facts. Third, we'll see that many factors suggest a directional lunar bombardment in the recent past, establishing the mechanism of that bombardment and its connection to both surface features and subsurface features on the moon will better establish the creationist position. Fourth, some have suggested a bombardment source from the general direction of the Earth, but Earth's gravity would tend to capture or deflect impactors headed for the moon. The Earth would be exposed to such a bombardment and the moon would be shielded. But we observe relatively few meteor craters on the Earth while there is a universally acknowledged heavy bombardment, especially on the near side of the moon. Ronald Samak wrote in his 2008 journal article on the origin of lunar Maria, he said, quote, I conclude from the distribution of true Maria, except for the ones possibly one or possibly two notable exceptions on the far side, that impactors hit preferentially on one side of the moon, the side facing Earth. Fifth rationale, the current academically accepted creationist theories fail to adequately document the source, the reason, the creative mechanism, or the resolution of events surrounding the lunar bombardment. And sixth, and finally, a better theory that answers questions about the moon and the lunar bombardment will be one more tool to be used in getting the attention of sincere-minded skeptics to help lead them to an understanding of creation and ultimately to faith in Jesus Christ, which is the overriding purpose of creation science. So let's quickly cover a few of the secular moon formation and feature theories Kind of do this just for fun. So capture theory became fashionable in the 1960s when a British physician, uh, a British physicist, Michael Wolfson, reintroduced a theory that was initially proposed by astronomer Thomas Jefferson Jackson C. a half century earlier. Here the theory is visualized as an object ambles by the Earth at just the right speed and in just the right position to be captured by Earth's gravity, and then almost magically. It is, it is it's established into orbit. So the capture theory dislodged the budding theory that had been proposed by Charles Darwin's son, George. Budding was dealt a near fatal blow when the Apollo missions returned lunar material, proving that the moon could not have budded and then been cast off a rapidly spinning Earth. So Charles Darwin's son's theory was out of fashion. Um, and speaking of Apollo, by the way, 
Apollo missions and the moon landings, did you know that the concern that the astronauts and the equipment would sink into a sea of dust billions of years deep was so great, that fear was so great that 16 Ranger and Surveyor probe missions were sent to the moon before man landed there. The anticipated super deep dust problem turned out not to exist. But that fear arose from the uni uniformitarian belief that the moon must be billions of years old and it's been gathering space dust at about the same rate all that time. But as you can see, there's the actual astronaut's actual footprint in about an inch of space dust. All right. And now, and now my cursor is on the screen. Thank you. That was tragic, but I'm so... I'm so focused on, on, on the goal at hand, I didn't notice that. Let me get that out of there. All right. <laughs> All right. So the footprints there, it turned out not to be a problem. Now let's get back to secular theories about the moon. In the 1970s, along came giant impact theory, which is currently fashionable in evolutionary circles. It proposes that a stray planetoid collided with the Earth and that the debris conveniently coalesced into the moon. Robin Canup, an astrophysicist in Boulder, Colorado, rem remarked upon the suggestion that he and many of his colleagues viewed the giant impact theory as, quote, ad hoc, probably unlikely, and possibly ridiculous, unquote. That's from a secular astronomer at uh, UC Boulder. But ridiculous has never been a non-starter for evolutionary theory, whether biological or cosmological. And ridiculous was no barrier to giant impact theory. In 1984, at a Lunar Origin Conference in Kona, Hawaii, giant impact, or big whack theory, as it was dubbed to give it a catchy name in the schoolyard, big whack gained currency, primarily due to the increasingly untenable assertions of the aforementioned capture theory. The fact that it seemed to account for the angle of the moon's orbital plane, the geochemical differences between the Earth and the moon, and the similar isotope ratios found in lunar samples made big whack the academic fashion from those hazy days of the 1970s right up until today. Even though it doesn't explain why the two lunar hemispheres differ in topography or why so many rocks similar to Earth's are found on the moon, how Earth survived such a catastrophic collision, doesn't explain the man in the moon, or any of a number of other problems with the theory that are far too numerous to catalog here. The list of problems with secular theories for the moon's formation and appearance caused Ron Shapiro, a Harvard astronomer, to make a telling little joke about it. Now, it's not the joke you see on your screen, that joke is a bit corny, and I just put that joke in there because I like to get as many jokes in as I can. But Shapiro's joke cut much more to the heart of secular difficulty explaining the moon. Shapiro said, quote, the best explanation for the moon is observational error. The moon does not exist. At which point everybody chuckled. But of course it does exist. And that's why the joke's funny. But for the evolutionists, it's not really ha-ha funny. And like the rest of their theories, it doesn't help us figure out where all that damage on the near side of the moon came from. It certainly doesn't help us figure out where the moon itself came from. And so secular theorists, when they're, they, they, they hold to some fantastical idea of collisions and things flying into magical orbits, and then to account for the, for the damage to the near side of the moon, they insert what they call the early and late heavy bombardments. That accounts for that lunar disfigurement and other cratering in the solar system, by the way. And we'll get back to considering bombardments, whether early or late or somewhere in between. But first, let's take a look at some of the creationist theories about the moon and even about the man in the moon. Wayne Spencer, in his fabulous 2008 article, invokes the plausible idea that events related to the fall set in motion naturalistic events that triggered a later bombardment. But his article doesn't adequately account for the source of the bombardment. He says in the article, quote, 
we do not know we do not know the impact bombardment i'm sorry we do not know how the impact bombardment at the flood event took place unquote and so it's refreshingly honest for dr spencer to admit that he simply doesn't know something um and we appreciate his thoughts on the topic but we hope to find a better theory that might help us to know because we want to know. So in a wonderful 2012 journal article, Michael Ord offers the possibility of supernatural protection of Earth during the bombardment event. Yet his article also fails to adequately account for the source of the impactors. And he invokes an extra biblical miracle. He says, quote, as creationists, we do not invoke miracles lightly, but scripture does say that God was intimately involved in the flood, unquote. Can't argue with that, but it strays to the extra biblical in our opinion. And the lack of a source of the bombardment, along with that extra biblical miracle, makes Ord's theory somewhat problematic for us. Danny Faulkner wrote in his outstanding 2014 article that the supernatural nature of creation permitted God to use bombardment events that had no component of judgment and could be viewed as either destructive or constructive, depending on their location, timing, and aftermath. And Faulkner presents uh, an outstanding explanation in that article of entropy before the fall, by the way, um, and a fantastic explanation of what is very good versus perfect. It's fantastic. But the article fails to establish how a chaotic bombardment, um, how does that fit with the orderly creation of the universe? And it also does not adequately account for a resolution of a, trans, a transient bombardment event that, uh, or, or a transient uh, event that led to his supposed day four bombardment. And he doesn't account for how that resolution could have left the earth unaffected by that event between day four and at least the fall, but possibly from day four all the way to the flood. Um, nor does Faulkner adequately elucidate the source of his second supposed judgment bombardment that, that took place at the time of the flood. So a great article, but just some loose ends, some things not answered. Walt Brown's hydroplate theory, as elucidated beginning in 1980 with the first edition of his book, In the Beginning, posits what we have found to be the most in-depth explanation for the man in the moon. He contends, and a little bit of this will be review, but I had to read most of this stuff 11 times before I understood it. So if it's a bit of review, bear with me. It'll help, especially for those of you who are new. Brown contends that at the creation, God separated the waters below the crust of the earth from the waters above it with the firmament. That firmament being the crust of the earth. Earth's crust rested upon the mantle via its pillars. The waters below the crust formed a contiguous chamber interrupted regularly by the pillars in which the water circulated via pressure differentials created by the tidal effects of the moon lifting and lowering the somewhat flexible crust ever so slightly every few hours. The subterranean water temperatures exceeded the critical temperature of 705 degrees Fahrenheit, supercritical, according to Brown's book, almost immediately after the creation, due to the pressure of the weight of the crust and the tidal pumping. Dr. Brown in his ninth edition writes the following, quote, as temperatures rose throughout the chamber before the flood, the water became supercritical and raised the crust temperature, but only so much. Eventually, heat escaping into the atmosphere and ultimately into space equaled the heat generated in the chamber. So there were no further temperature increases, a situation called a steady state. That state was reached without pressures or temperatures that would cause the crust to fail. Therefore, it was either man's sinful actions or inactions or a direct act of God that later caused the crust or the pillars to fail. Unquote. That's from in the beginning of the ninth edition. Now we're going to get to how this structural failure on earth quite literally impacts the moon. 
But our question regarding the hydroplate model was that such a steady state of heat dissipation governed by material science and the physical laws as we observe them today will always break down eventually. That steady state may have been steady, but it would not have been eternal. And for us, this was a problem. Now, the lack of an eternal means of preventing catastrophe is of no concern to most Christians. They just assume that God either foreordained sin and death and the flood, or they assume that God always knew sin and death would enter the world. He even knew exactly when. And so the flood was always a foregone conclusion, even on day six of creation, when God called everything very good. Either way, in the view of most Christians and most creationists, Earth's heat dissipation mechanism would not need to last forever. But a biblical view of God's foreknowledge and righteousness indicates to us that God was prepared for the very good nature of his creation to be eternal, just as he was prepared to intervene if the situation changed. And so we assume there must have been some mechanism not yet described in any flood theory or model that facilitated the prevention of the flood. Um, and in the case of the hydroplate theory, that, uh, that the dissipation of excess heat could have been carried on eternally. A mechanism that could have prevented the catastrophe for eternity had things gone that way. Now we're going to return to our, our ideas about the eternal steady state. But for now, I want to continue with the hydroplates accounting for the man in the moon. So we have the heat and the pressure is building. The supercritical water forcing its way through the 60 mile thick granite crust. And cracks begin to form as water is being pushed up through the foundations by the supercritical water as it erodes and corrodes. And then all of a sudden, a single crack formed at the surface. It raced down through the crust to the pressurized supercritical water beneath. And in one day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. As we read in Genesis 7, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. As the floodwaters escaped from the subterranean chambers, they swept up rocks and dirt from the cliffs on either side of the crack. The pillars fluttered and bounced, being crushed as they were forced to carry more and more weight of the overlying crust. The walls of the rupture were unstable because the, the rocks just not strong enough to support a cliff more than five miles high. And so the 60 mile high walls were eroded as they crumbled into the flow of the fountains of the supercritical water exploding through the ever-widening crack in the crust of the earth. As lower portions of the walls crumbled, more and more dirt and mud and rocks and giant chunks of the earth's crust, some as big as 600 feet in diameter, were swept up and launched by the jetting fountains with almost unimaginable force. A significant amount of the mass launched with enough force to leave Earth's atmosphere and escape Earth's gravitational sphere of influence. Now, if you're not familiar with gravitational spheres of influence, let me quickly explain. Everything has a gravitational sphere of influence. And in space, that sphere of influence becomes stronger for a smaller body. As that smaller body moves away from a more massive body, that smaller body's sphere of influence gets bigger. Um, an example, the Apollo 13 astronaut, astronauts, while they were traveling to the moon, they dumped some waste material overboard. And the waste that they dumped was traveling at nearly the same velocity as their spacecraft. So at first, the waste moved away, but then the ship's gravity pulled it back. And that waste orbited the spacecraft all the way to the moon until the moon's sphere of influence took over and the, the waste ended up um, on the moon. Now, to achieve what's called escape velocity and be launched into space from the Earth, 
Some of the ejected crust achieve speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour. You've heard how many kilometers a second? Well, it's 25,000 miles per hour. That's the speed required for an object to be propelled beyond the Earth's atmosphere and beyond its gravitational sphere of influence and on out into space. A bullet fired from an AR-15 travels at about one-tenth that speed. So the forces involved in the fountains bursting forth is almost incomprehensible. But upon an inspection of the scene on the moon and elsewhere, these forces are fairly well explained by Dr. Brown and the hydroplate theory. Pressure and heat due to the tidal pumping described earlier, along with nuclear energy generated by the crust as it fluttered violently, generating enormous electrical currents combined to turn the Earth into a pressure-generating machine for a period of days, perhaps even weeks, as Noah's flood got underway. This heat and pressure machine drove the fountains to jettison more and more of Earth's crust as the days went by. So imagine the Earth behaving like a giant pressurized sprinkler head, spinning on its axis, shooting out continuous torrents of water and debris into space from a rupture going all the way around for a period of anywhere from a few days to possibly a few weeks. Imagine that and you begin to appreciate the precarious position the moon would have been in. The moon was within the reach of the torrents of water and debris constantly for days and weeks. And so according to Dr. Brown's model, some of the ejecta struck the moon and with tremendous force. So this, this changed the moon's inertia and it caused the moon to rock back and forth like the face of a pendulum swinging above the earth. Eventually, tidal stretching removed most of the moon's spin energy. So the oscillation subsided and the moon stabilized and now the denser, heavier side of the moon was locked in place. So now the man in the moon always faces Earth. And now because of the moon's gravitational sphere of influence, even after that initial massive impact event, subsequent masses of debris would have been drawn toward the moon. Some may have been captured and orbited before coalescing and crashing down into the moon. And then of course, much of the debris kicked up by the impacts would coalesce, orbit, and later crash, leading to discrete impact events that would have ranged in size from massive, to microscopic and all the way around all the surfaces 360 degrees around the sphere of the moon would have would have suffered impacts these impacts would have occurred for years decades maybe even centuries after that initial impact event at the breaking up of the fountains so the hydroplate theory contends that 1.22 percent of the 3% of Earth's crust that was ejected struck the leading edge of the near side of the moon first, with secondary and tertiary impacts occurring for some time, but all related directly to the fountains of the Great Deep. Some of these impacts would have been massive enough to penetrate deep into the moon, causing the production of and the release of magma, which would have flowed out and filled or partially filled many of the impact craters, especially on the near side. And that's exactly what we see with the man in the moon. The maria that were thought to be seas back in Gal Galileo's time are actually lava beds produced during and after the bombardment that came from the earth. So now I wanna take you through several lines of evidence that support the hypothesis. Okay, first, tr uh, traces of water have been found at all lunar latitudes by three different spacecraft. The Bible tells us a thing is established by two or three witnesses. Well, NASA's M3 and the, the VIMS on Cassini and the high-resolution infrared imaging spectrometer on, on the epoxy spacecraft have all found traces of water at all latitudes on the moon. Now, according to secular models... Comets deposit ice on the moon every so often, but the ice should evaporate faster than comets deposit it. 
So why does so much ice remain? Well, perhaps it was deposited recently by events initiated in the fountains of the great deep. Um, almost all deep moonquakes are on the near side. And hydroplate theory predicts this as the largest impacts uh, introduced volcanism and, and changed the structure and the density and the gravity of the moon and produced lava and volcanism. And, and all that occurred primarily on the near side of the moon. So the near side of the moon is far more unstable. So you would expect more moonquakes on the near side. The Grail satellite detected cracks that brought up lava to the surface, and it's still visible in lava tubes. So this had to have happened uh, rapidly, and obviously recently we can still see the signs of the lava flows. Uh, large impacts shifted rock within the moon and produced deep frictional melting. Magma produced below the moon's crossover depth would sink to the moon's center and form the moon's small liquid outer core that, by the way, was confirmed, discovered in 2011. That core has not had time to cool and solidify. And again, there's lots of evidence for magma flowing as lava in the past on the lunar surface as well. And this would all indicate that that moon has not been hanging out there for, for four billion years or three or two or one or even a million years. Contemporaries of Galileo may have misnamed the dark lava flows as seas because they look smooth like water through their telescopes, uh, but they did flow at one time. And it's these maria, and, and we've slightly enhanced them here for the man in the moon effect. It's those maria that give the moon the man in the moon appearance that we see on a clear night, especially with a big full moon. Um, of the moon's 31 giant basins, only 11 are on the far side. The location of most lunar basins makes it a 93% certainty that a bombardment from that direction occurred. The largest of which, by the way, occurred rapidly like a shotgun blast. Large impacts formed the giant basins and their impact energy melted the rock below, generated the lava flows. That, that also, by the way, expanded the moon's radius by somewhere between about a half a kilometer and, and as much as about five kilometers. And what that did, well, many ancient cultures worldwide had a 360-day year and a 30-day lunar month. But according to Dr. Brown's calculations, if just 1.22% of the debris launched from the Earth by the fountains of the Great Deep hit the moon, the lunar month would have changed from 30 days to its present 29.53-day lunar month. And the, the moon's circular orbit would have become the, ellip the elliptical shape that we see today with its eccentricity of 0 0.0549. Uh, the isotope ratios in lunar soil correspond not to the lunar wind, but to what's found on Earth. And in 2019, as you've heard, researchers declared that they determined the oldest rock, the oldest Earth rock ever found was in fact found on the moon. So this is a map that shows the moon's gravity and how it varies over its surface. Red indicates unusually strong gravity. So obviously the moon received five extremely powerful impacts. And notice that the three largest mass concentrations that appear on the map in red, they're called mass cons. Notice that they all appear in a straight line. Remember, I had mentioned earlier a shotgun blast, a rapid impact event. Well, perhaps the large rocks that formed these mass cons were part of that one massive object or one, one massive group of objects that were pulled apart by gravity before hitting the moon and, and then gravitationally locking that side of the that now much more massive side of the moon toward the earth. So it's as if the man in the moon is looking down at us, reminding us of God's judgment. And so those are the lines of evidence that convince us that the hydroplate theory best explains the man in the moon um, and other features of the moon and the solar system. Um, but I want to conclude by returning to an earlier question we left unanswered 
regarding how Earth could have dissipated the excess heat and avoided a catastrophe eternally had sin and death not entered the picture when they did. How could that have happened? Well, the scriptures indicate that God was prepared for the possibility of sin and death. In fact, his son prepared for it by assuring the father that if sin and death entered, he would do what was necessary to reconcile heaven and earth and to save out of mankind a people for himself to the glory of the Father forever. We know that. We're told that in the Bible. First Peter in the first chapter tells believers that you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Praise Jesus. Praise the Lord. So we can see that Jesus Christ was foreordained before the foundation of the earth. And on Genesis and in Genesis chapter 1 at the end uh, day 6 God said everything was very good and God is not a man that he should lie. And so when he said on the 6th day that everything he'd made was very good, he meant that everything he'd made, the heaven, the earth, the man that he'd formed out of the dust of the earth, he meant that all of that could and would endure forever, no matter what happened. Now, again, according to hydroplate theory, supercritical water in the subterranean chamber would have created a corrosive action that would have begun undermining Earth's crust almost immediately after creation. But the scripture reveals something interesting about Earth's crust in Genesis 1, starting in verse 6. If you have your Bible, you can turn there and check me out. You should always do that whenever someone quotes the Bible. Grab one, check them out. Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 6, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters, which were under the firmament, from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament, heaven. So according to Genesis, earth was originally in heaven. Earth was a place in God's heavenly kingdom. And we know that Adam and Eve were not separated from God at the time because God literally walked with them. We know this because on the day they fell, we're told that God was walking in the garden, expecting to find them there. Genesis 3 tells us in verse 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. We know that God had previously walked with Adam in the garden. We're told in chapter 2, verse 19, Genesis 2, 19, The Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and he brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. So just as Adam and Eve were not separated from God before the curse, neither was the earth. And we're convinced that earth's physical presence in God's heavenly realm was the mechanism by which excess heat was removed before the fall. And we believe that that heavenly interface prevented the buildup of any supercritical water at all so that no corrosion of the mantle or the crust occurred before the fall. We assert that after the fall, just as man was separated from God by death, earth was separated from heaven by the fall. God said to Adam in, in, in Genesis 3, verse 17, Cursed is the ground for your sake. In sorrow you shall eat it all the days of your life. All the days of your life. So God's curse altered the ground, right? 
And that alteration, according to the text here, placed a limit on the days of a man's life, almost as if a timer had been set. And so the whole creation fell. And we think of that as uh, a rhetorical device to say that it fell, but perhaps it fell more literally than we really can comprehend. The creation fell from its place in heaven and it became subject to the natural laws that we see today. And the water in the subterranean chamber, deep beneath the ground, the ground that was now cursed, well, that great deep now referred to in Genesis became a ticking time bomb. And so Dr. Brown was correct in his assertion in his book, In the Beginning, when he said, quote, it was either man's sinful actions or inactions or a direct act by God that later caused caused the crust or the pillars to fail. So it was the cursing of the ground and it was the fall from heaven. So it was a combination of man's sinful actions and a direct act of God that eventually caused the crust and the pillars to fail. Because sin had entered and sin entered the creation and with it death. And we're told in the scripture that death then passed upon all men ever since, right? And you watching this presentation right now, the shadow of death hangs over your head right now. None of us knows if we'll have even one more day on this earth. Every one of us finds ourselves in a, in, in a very precarious and fearful state because we're alive for the moment, but certain death awaits. Certain death, a catastrophe awaits. But just as God delivered humanity through the catastrophic events of the global flood in Noah's Ark, God has made a way for you to escape. You can also escape certain death just the same way Noah escaped the catastrophe of the flood. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever should believe on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ is the son of God who came to earth and he lived as a man. And at Calvary, he died as a man, taking upon himself the sin and the guilt of the whole world, of you and of me. And on the third day, he arose. Jesus achieved victory over death, and he offers the fruit of that victory freely to you if you'll believe. Just like Noah believed and he built the ark, will you believe? Because if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and you confess that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And so if you've never believed, I want to talk with you. Um, I'd like to tell you more about the, the creation, the flood, and the moon, and the curse, and why Jesus, why Jesus came, and what he's done to save the world, and how he can save you. So um, if you've never believed, send me your information in the Q&A chat. I'd love to get in touch with you and tell you more. Um, and that, that concludes our presentation on the man in the moon. And I appreciate everyone's attention. And again, all the work that all of you have put into putting this conference on. Um, Brian, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Doug. Man, that was some great information there, too. And uh, thank you for covering the gospel, because uh, that's uh, what's going to matter in 100 years. I'll ask college students a lot or whoever, you know, where, where are you going to be in a hundred years? And, uh, if we, it's it, focusing on that, it's very, very important. And Dr. Walt Brown, he's given us a really big tool to point people to, to the Bible and the Bible's perspective is right. And that everybody was Doug McBurney and he's got the weekly worldview.com. If you want to check him out, it's uh, well worth your time. And, uh, let's, uh, jump into the questions here. Oh boy. Oh yeah. John Canfield. He says, uh, he wants to say hi, the creationist curmudgeon. Um, oh yes. Yes, indeed. You got, you know, everybody. Okay. How long would a, the Mar Maria last? Like as far as being real visible and noteworthy as far as recent, do you have any idea on that? 
Well, so, you know, the, the estimates of how fast the moon collects dust are rather unsettled. That's for sure. So they, they, they've been or but if, if you, if you take a thousand year creation and you look at how much dust uh, sure. Neil Armstrong stepped into, there was about an inch, right? So how long would it take to fill some of these some of the craters in Maria are kilometers deep. And so wow. I would imagine it would last for millions of years. There would be some visibility of the Maria. Sure, sure, sure. And the, the moon is drifting away. Does the uh, hydro plate have any reason for that? We lose about what is an inch or half an inch every year. I mean, that's tough for billions of years uh, relationship, but it fits our young earth real well but do you have any sort of a reason why that would be so if if i if i recall um that the drift of the moon doesn't really have anything to do with anything more than simply the mass of the moon and the the associated spheres of gravitational influence it's to be expected that the moon should be drifting away and again it, it's not necessarily evidence for anyone's particular creation or right. flood model, but it is the moon has not been drifting away for 4.5 billion no, years. <laughs> no, 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 no. And I've seen something on that too. It's something like the tides or something just kind of pulling it. I've seen the math for it physically. It's that's just the way it does. What I thought was interesting about the moon is that it doesn't orbit the earth at the equator, you know, right. it's on the orbital plane of the, what, what the earth is on. Because if it orbited the equator, we'd hardly ever get a, a lunar eclipse. Right. And uh, yeah, yeah, that was uh, quite amazing. Um, let's see here. I think you might have answered a lot of those questions. Okay. Well, I, I was going to say, uh, I watched Kevin Lee's uh, presentation and I wanted to tell him, you know, Kevin, your presentation actually presents more answers then it does questions. <laughs> oh, was so amazing to see the uh, the confirmation of oh, uh, of those rock piles. That was phenomenal. Oh yeah. These can, I, are... can, can I add an answer to the moon thing? It, it's sure. just it's a physics thing. The rotational yeah. energy of the Earth is being imparted to the velocity of the moon. It, it has nothing to do with anything. It's just the laws of physics sure. that the, yep. the the tidal pull on Earth. It, that relationship, the rotation. So the earth is slowing down and yep. making the moon travel faster. That's, okay. that's just, it's a fact of physics. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Would the hydroplane need a miracle to destroy the earth, uh, for, to keep the earth from being destroyed? Uh, prior well, so, to well, so this has been the, uh, and so I, I'm just going to make a confession real quick. Cause I think I have time. So the paper that Ellen, inspired Nicole and I to write was originally submitted to the ICC. So the ICC is not considered That's, hydroplate friendly. Let's just say that. And ICC is International Convention for Conference for Creationism. For creationism. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the International Conference for Creationism out in Cedarville, Ohio, where we attended. So we submitted the paper to the peer review group at ICC. And so we, I felt like I have to say something bad about hydroplate theory or these guys aren't even going to read my paper. So, so, um, but one of, one of the, one of the problems I'd always thought I had with, with hydroplate was this ticking time bomb problem that the, okay. the, that the heat and the pressure were eventually going to crack through the earth. And in the ninth edition, while I had only read the eighth edition, and 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 the thing about the hydroplate theory is the book is so thick and there's so much of it that you can read it and miss a lot of stuff. Oh yeah. And so I didn't realize that Walt had uh, Walt had explained the steady state theory, and that it what there was no ticking time bomb problem. But as you can see from my presentation and the paper we submitted, I disagree that the steady state answer was enough. Okay. But did God need a miracle to prevent? No, he did not. God did not need a miracle because if earth was a part of heaven, heaven was never going to suffer a catastrophic destruction. 
It was never going to happen. Sure. But as Walt said, man's sinful action and a direct by God leading to the fall means that God was involved in what led to the eventual catastrophe. But I would posit that it was not miraculous, that it was naturalistic, that once sin and death entered the picture, both man and earth could no longer be in heaven naturally. They could not. Okay. All right. Thank you. We'll do one quick question. Uh, if you run the movie backwards and the moon falls underneath the, the Roche limit, uh, how long would it have been before the moon would have been rolling along the surface? The you know, if, if uh, maybe I, if Kevin or Brian Nicola. Yeah, Walt, Walt deals with that in his book. It's one of the strongest arguments that we have to be less than a billion because the it, it is a fact, again, that you can spin it back if the moon and earth were created together. Yep. Right. And the moon is getting closer and closer and closer to the earth. <laughs> and in a billion years, it'd be so close, it would be ripping the earth apart. A billion years. So when they yeah. say 4.5 billion years, then they they have to also say the moon had to have come after you know way into their billions of years because in a billion years it's ripping the earth apart okay it's gravitation right. thank you thank you thank you right